The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon and welcome to this GRCI Law webinar on the challenges for the Data Protection Officer. This is me, my name is Sean Wright um, and I'm a Data Protection Officer with um, quite a few years of experience working in the legal governance, risk and compliance space um, before becoming a DPA and specialising um, in data protection. I think this is important because um, having worked in the commercial world, I have a good understanding of the commercial needs of businesses um, in different types of organisations. Um, so can work um, not just as a business prevention sort of function of the business, um, but more to promote and help businesses with their compliance requirements. So I'm now part of the team of um, DPOs at GRCI Law. So today we have around 45 minutes to take a look at um, a few items, starting with who GRCI Law is, an introduction to what the role of the Data Protection Officer sort of looks like and the requirements of fulfilling that position. We will then look at the types of activities DPOs can help with and then some of the challenges that companies and organisations and the DPO itself face um, along with some real life examples. We'll then end with some questions. We'll have time. You can type your questions into the GoToWebinar box on the side. So GRCI Law is a subsidiary of the GRCI International Group, PRC, and we provide a range of services to support organisations um, with their data protection requirements um, with a whole host of different experts and different tools um, and products available to help with that. The DPO teams themselves are retained on normally long-term contracts by our clients to deliver DPO or privacy services or the services you can see listed there um, to them as and when they need them. This ranges from sort of gap analysis, project planning um, to EU rep and possibly UK rep services in the future. We deal with um, a different, all different variety of industries, um, bringing in experts where required. So some example clients, um, there's a list here. This gives you an idea of the sort of broad remit that we cover for our DPA services um, and the sort of broad range of knowledge that our DPA is required to be able to fulfill the role of a DPA amongst amongst our clients. So the DPO really has to immerse themselves into these types of organisations from universities to clinical research organisations, whilst also taking into consideration the other laws and regulations that may apply to these businesses. Um, not only obviously the GDPR, the Data Protection Act 2018 in the UK, but also the differences, um, how different countries have um, put the GDPR into their local legislation and other pieces of legislation and regulations that affect businesses such as um, in the NHS, you've got the Data Security and Protection Toolkits, the NIS directives. Um, we also deal with aviation industry, so we have understanding of pollution and reporting, all sorts of nuances within businesses. Um, including things like anti-money laundering checks, um, PSD2, and of course um, ISO and other external certification requirements. So GRCI Law has, as I said, a team of DPAs. We also have other professionals um, and a team of lawyers amongst us, um, but the group as a whole has a, quite a few different companies that provide services such as um, PCI DSS services, um, cyber security, um, lots of training within um, the, the training department, either in classroom based or online. We have our own publishing department, 
our own penetration testing teams and other companies such as Vigilance Software and GDPR.co.uk and DQM who provide um, tools such as data flow mapping, data impact assessments um, and risk management tools. So where does the DPO fit in within the GDPR? Um, I'm going to try and cover this quickly because I'm sure we all have a sort of good understanding by now of, of what this looks like. So the G this applies to both processors and controllers, depending on what their activities are. So you can either appoint a DPO voluntarily um, or you may be required to do so by law um, and all public authorities will automatically require a DPO. There is working party guidance available on this because it's quite a big question for businesses to answer whether they do fall in this remit or not. Um, that guidance was published back in 2016 by um, Article 29 Working Group. So the voluntary DPO appointments are encouraged by this working group and they did state in their paper that the DPO is actually the cornerstone of accountability and facilitates the compliance and gives companies a competitive advantage. So what does it look like to fulfil the DPO role? There are no particular set guidance on the professional qualities of the DPO. However, they need to have the qualities that will make them able to fulfil all your GDPR requirements. There is a little bit of guidance from different supervisory authorities throughout the EU, but it comes down to really what your processes look like. Um, there's a lot of project management involved within this um, and obviously having to have a good grip on your industry that you're working within. So it enables the DPO to be able to look at your data protection impact assessments, look at your risk management from your industry perspective and relative to the to the processing activities that you carry out and also with regards to the law other laws that you're trying to to deal with at the same time as gdpr the dpo also has a big requirement to be independent which is quite a tricky thing to do with it within an organization because the dpo cannot be instructed on how they carry out their tasks. So being an employee of a company, obviously that's quite a tricky thing to not have to follow your, your managers or directors um, sort of direction on what you're trying to achieve. And you have to be free from the views of an organisation as well. So to, to really take a back step and look at the whole organisation um, in relation to the laws. It's also an element of not being able to mark your own work <clears throat> So if you're, you're head of IT and you're setting up all the access controls within a company or have the ability to move data or put new systems in place, you shouldn't really be the DPO um, sort of signing those, those pieces of work off. DPOs are also protected um, in some ways under GDPR from dismissal or penalties for carrying out their tasks. So that can also be a challenge and something that needs to be thought about. Um, when looking at the DPO role. So DPOs are normally people that have worked within industry and have quite a good um, knowledge, obviously, of the GDPR and previous data protection legislation uh, and have, have a good ability to review all the processes that you carry out within your organisation. So the DPO's responsibilities and activities, um, this is set out in GDPR of the things that the DPO should be responsible for, um, starting with monitoring and com monitoring the compliance of your organisation with the laws. So the DPO really um, the people they're working with and have some sort of relationship with other people in the organisation. So typically you would you know the HR managers quite well, the CISOs or IT people, um, and also um, a high level directors or senior management. So the monitoring and compliance part um, can also look like 
reviewing all the documentation that you have within your business and all the processes that you have associated with those and making sure that they work in line with the GDPR. Um, and this is sort of supported then with reports, either meeting notes or producing management reports that can be viewed within the business um, and go up to a board level. In terms of informing and advising on data protection obligations, um, as DPAs we do a lot of work in the background for our clients generally. This, there's mainly sort of horizon scanning for new laws, new guidance, um, generally in data, the data protection world, but also in the industries that our clients are within. And checking really for best practice um, working across multiple clients is, is a very good opportunity to see what, what's going on and what the regulators are sort of recommending uh, and learning from any issues um, and breaches that we, that we deal with. Um, the DPA will then talk through any issues with their clients um, as they either come up within the organisation or as we see them from industry or regulators. A big part also of the DPA role and activities is, is the risk management, um, the risks that is associated with the data processing activities that you carry out within your organisation, and making sure that we minimise those risks where we can, and any remaining risks are, are well managed um, to board level or either to the supervisory authorities for any mitigations. data protection impact assessments, mainly making sure that they're done and that any risks are identified and really using that document as a living document. You, you can't just do these things as a one-off activity and then just leave them. It's the role for the DPA to identify anything that we might need to check up on and keep a regular review of those documents. So moving to the key challenges faced by DPOs, um, we'll, we'll try and work through most of this list. It was, it was very hard to put together. There, there are so many challenges, I think, with a new piece of legislation <coughs> that's a, as broad and, and as new as the GDPR. Um, so this list could have been a, a lot bigger, but I will try and work through, through them all. So we'll start with the key um, Number one here, the lack of data protection knowledge within organisations. So when I say this, I mean I don't mean just the knowledge of the GDPR, I mean also the knowledge of the organisation itself, because what we're seeing is people have done GDPR training, they might have done an online course or watched some videos or, or even had some good in-depth training. But without the good knowledge of what your organization is trying to achieve and the actual data processing that happens, it's very hard to apply the GDPR and the requirements of it. And of course, companies may not have the dedicated roles to fulfill their GDPR requirements, or if they do, they might not have the, the structure that they need in place to be able for them to implement those things. For example, you might have an IT manager that's really well prepped on GDPR, they know all the security things, they know exactly where things are, but they wouldn't necessarily know how recruitment, for example, works within their HR team. So they might not be looking for um, or knowing that they need to do a data protection impact assessment on a new processing activity of recruitment or background checking. So it really do need to to have a, have a view of every department and what they're doing. So another example of that might be um, operational staff not knowing how to recognise um, a subject access request, or they might know how to recognise it, or they, but they might not know there are time limits applied to those. Um, we see this on a very regular occurrence that DSARs are either given verbally and people don't give them to the right people or they're sat in people's inboxes or spam boxes. They don't know how important they actually are. And this quite often results in an ICA complaint and then the data protection officer needs to pick that up and manage that accordingly. Um, I had a very <laughs> good 
good, a good example of this recently where um, a DSA was filed, but actually the file had been lost, but no one had told people about this. Um, so we had, well, we had an incident and a DSA at the same time, which was quite an interesting challenge. The next one is undocumented data flows. So there is a requirement to have your Article 30 records of processing activities in place. Um, and then best practice to take that and turn that into an actual data flow diagram. This really helps not just the DPO, but within your organization, really know what's going on um, and where the data is flowing in an emergency situation where you haven't got time to go through the whole um, Article 30 record or make some sense of it. You can very quickly see what happens. Um, and then for the DPA, this makes it difficult to ensure things like privacy notices are adequate or um, the lawful basis for processing has been established. And, and, and that's a very important point because if we haven't established the lawful basis for processing, it's very difficult to see what the data subject rights are and how we're going to protect them. It also makes fulfilling a DSAR really difficult if you don't know where to start looking or your Article 30 record is so complicated, you can't sort of fathom out very quickly where you need to go and who you need to speak to. The same goes for um, any sort of cyber attack or any incident. If you don't know which servers are hosting which data, you don't know which, which to switch off first or, or which systems to shut down. And then for DPO, looking at items such as Brexit, um, it's very important that we have got a good understanding of where the data flows are, especially at the moment for data flowing from the EU into the UK, so that we can start looking at what legal mechanisms might be required to ensure that remains uh, a legal mechanism for, for receiving data. So the next challenge is the, the complexities around some of the DSARs that we see and the complaints from the Information Commissioner's Office. DSARs can, can often be quite complicated um, and you really need to have the right people to help understand what has happened and to document what has happened. Many issues can stretch back you know, quite a long time, definitely pre-GDPR. And we need the, the sort of history to be able to know what's happened and how we can then fulfill that DSAR. Um, so you do need some sort of experience from the organization or your DPO really know who to go to, to ensure that DSARs are answered satisfactorily to prevent any further questioning from, from the supervisory authorities. And we see that DSAR complaints can often go on for a long time, as the people mainly doing them um, can quite often be disgruntled employees or customers, and there's often other legal action going on at the same time. Okay, so the next one is really the lack of due diligence requirements on third party subprocessors. So a big requirement of the GDPR um, is that you can't um, subcontract everything out anymore. You can't, you have to be able to see your data flow as a controller, where it goes, whether they're using subprocessors, whether they're using other third parties. And we see either no due diligence at all going on or very little. Um, so having that visibility of end-to-end -end activities is, is very hard, um, especially if you're dealing with incidents or data subject access requests. Um, the due diligence is also a sort of good housekeeping thing and makes you think about whether perhaps that new activity does mean the DPIA or whether there should be a data processing agreement in place. So it's sort of the start of your GDPR on a new process, so to speak. Um, I've had a, an example of this again recently where a company was using a, a third party recruitment consultant who were using a piece of software, um, due diligence wasn't done. 
And actually it, it turned out that this piece of software was scraping the customer's website using a Google tool um, and actually took not only the job roles during its scrape, it took the patients that were associated with it, including their medical condition and their location. We only found out about this when we saw it on the website um, and it did actually take two and a half days to get that data taken out. So it's things like that that could really be prevented by doing some good due diligence, understanding what your third parties are doing and who they're interacting with as well. So the next one is actually a good, a good challenge for DPAs and, and a good for businesses if they're rapidly growing. Um, there's often very little time for it to put in good change management processes or to really stick to structures whilst you're trying to grow so quickly. This could be from um, your customer base growing, your employee headcounts going up, all the tools and software that you're using um, increasing. And it's really great as a DPO to help support these businesses doing this and sort of keeping them on the right track, and reminding them of the things and processes they need to put in place to be able to do this um, effectively and stopping them from sort of getting off to a bad start and having to go back retrospectively to do things um, to document what they've done. It really is a good opportunity to get all that in line, get all your policies reviewed get them all ready, especially if you've got lots of customers asking lots of questions, lots of big RFIs to complete um, or um, other due diligence requirements from your, your prospects. It does, I think, make you look in much better shape if you can quickly turn those documents around and explain the processing that you're doing. We do see trouble, though, when things are going so quickly. Um, I've seen um, a CISO sort of ignore things, um, IT managers ignore things, and people buying, for example, um, a, a software as a service solution, buying the license on their credit cards to, to avoid the, of a very lengthy delay through the procurement cycle of their business. But then, unfortunately, the due diligence was missed, um, which then impacted things like the Article 30 records of processing wasn't updated. We weren't able to give privacy notices or, or accurate privacy notices for this new processing activity. Um, then had a DSAR, which we couldn't fulfill because we weren't aware of this extra activity going on. Um, and that you know, may end in fines or enforcement action from the ICA. So the challenge of rapidly growing companies is a good one for GPAs to, to get in hand and to help with. So the next one, obviously a lot of the companies we work with are international companies um, or are providing services abroad. And they have very sort of different complex requirements and different privacy laws in place that they have to deal with. Not only that, they might have sub-processes in other countries um, that they're not, not operating in or data centres um, that they're not familiar with the, the country's laws. So it is important to be aware of other laws. Um, I think a good example is in Germany, where if you have more than 10 employees and permanently process personal data, you have to have a data protection officer, which is vastly different to the general principle um, under GDPR. So we do need to look at local laws and nuances to make sure that we've captured those for our clients. Another good example is um, the data localization rules. There are quite a few countries that make you um, store your data locally and employees especially, um, make sure they're hosted in the country that they're in. Um, Russia is always a good example of that. And the multitude of different laws in China, depending on the industry type um, or the type of data you're processing. So that's another challenge we have um, as DPAs. I don't think I could have put a list together of challenges without talking about the lack of internal resources. Um, but we always find in organisations and any prudent organisation will obviously um, be trying to be prudent with their funds. 
But this obviously does cause some issues with GDPR um, and other compliance issues. The DPO independent status, though, really does help with this, as we can raise the risks that occur due to this lack of resource, and we can discuss it with senior management or the board within the company to make sure that we get their attention and explain to them you know, why we need to be doing this. For example, um, if you want to deploy encryption at rest and you need more service space to do so, the cost of that could be quite considerable. Um, but if you explain the risks um, from a DPO perspective, sometimes that's very helpful in getting those resources you need. Again, if you talk about things like the need for penetration testing, um, the DPO's role really is to explain the benefits of that and, and to make sure that the directors know that they're accountable for not putting in reasonable um, efforts to, to make sure that their systems are protected. Um, and penetration testing is very, a, a very common one that people um, struggle to get the finance for because it's quite a, quite a cost to a business. The DPA as well will make sure that if there is some problems with getting some resources internally, that the directors actually will sign to accept that risk. Getting any director to, to go into a document and actually physically have to sign it normally gets their attention and makes them read it. Um, and getting them to sign it, that, that very, very, very often works to get their attention. So the next one we have is poor risk management process. So there's either no risk registers in a company, um, specifically probably no GDPR risk registers, um, or there is a risk register that's not actively managed, which can be equally or if not more dangerous thing to do. You'll see here that all GDPR items sort of interact with each other and help each other along. For example, if a DPIA shows some risks, um, the least risks really should be added to the risk register um, so the DPO can monitor it. So there is a requirement there to have a risk register in place um, alongside your DPIAs. And these risks really could, could come from a range of items such as the risk of a project having some scope creep that we're not aware of, to disgruntled employees, um, new laws coming into to play. For example, when PSD D2 um, first came out, there was lots of questions and interactions with, with GDPR. Um, supply risk management would be an item often seen. And of course, at the moment, we're looking at the risks surrounding Brexit. So board accountability and evidence, this is another big challenge for any compliance person, I think you'll all agree. Um, staff are very often reluctant to go to the board about items, especially about GDPR, but it is the board that's ultimately responsible and the DPO can help drive this. Um, as I previously said, you know, telling the directors the risks of what they're doing, the board often does get their attention. Um, and especially items such as the privacy and electronic communications regulations, where there is some directors' personal liability, they often do then want to know what's going on. So monitoring DSARs, especially during holiday periods, and I've selected this specifically because we see this an awful lot, um, having just gone through the summer period as well. Um, and I made the point earlier, it's not just about the lack of knowledge around DSARs, it's also about the availability of the right information and the right people, uh, especially within institutions such as educational establishments that may have very long holiday periods, especially universities. Um, and people being on holiday, perhaps for a week or two or three, that, and they're the only ones that hold the information we need to satisfy the request. Um, the ICO aren't going to to look kindly at you if you say you can't fulfill something just because that person's on holiday. We really should have the processes and procedures in place to allow us to deal with that regardless. Um, and another big challenge there is also people that leave the organisation with all the knowledge you need. So putting that um, on your leavers process is very helpful to capture that 
as people leave. Um, and I have put GDPR as a tick box exercise, and I actually felt pained whilst I wrote this because I hate this word tick box exercise. But I really do think that the compliance cultures are shifting away from this previous thought um, of just a tick box exercise. But in saying that, we do see that people think they only have to do some of the GDPR activities once. Um, for example, a lot of companies went and rushed and did their Article 30s record of processing as GDPR was coming into play, but haven't looked at it since. So they put a lot of time, effort, money into it, but actually if you look at it a year and a half later, it's to not much avail. And a DPO can really help make sure that you are updating it and pointing out things that are going on within your organisation that really should be added to that register. Um, it's very hard, you know, you know, since GDPR came in, how do you know if things have changed? How do you know if your IT department have changed their encryption levels? How do you know if people have left the business or have upped their access into certain systems? Um, and all these things really need to be thought through and documented, which is why regular contact with your DPO is really important. So some examples of some DPO's real life activities. Um, so we always start with a gap analysis, um, either done by ourselves or by a previous company, and we'll take that as our as our base point. This drives then the action point plans that the, the DPO will work with, and it's a really good record of progress of the activity. And not only that, going through that gap analysis or that GDPR action plan. It's such a fabulous opportunity for the data protection officer to get to know your business and to, to interview the different people within the organization um, and have the time to document what's really going on. Another one here, um, the next one is marketing campaigns and bought in lists. The DPA can really help with business strategies such as marketing campaigns, to make sure that they are done in compliant fashion. Um, that's not only with GDPR and like PECA regulations as well. Um, I've had a client recently be brought in some marketing lists to do some um, email marketing campaigns to EU citizens. And as we were going through the, the, the documentation on that, um, as a DPO, we checked the lawful basis that that data was collected upon, and it turned out that there actually wasn't consent within that data, and that legitimate interest was the lawful basis that had been collected under, and therefore that limited what, what the company could do with that data, um, and really only telephone communications was agreed on as um, the next step forward, as we could do a legitimate interest assessment for that. Um, and in it, during that sort of piece of work, it involves talking to the vendors, supplying those lists, going through the documentation that they can provide and working with the client on how they can sort of achieve the best result for the business. As I've said before, it's, it's not about preventing you from doing things, it's, it's making it in a, that you do things in a compliant fashion. Um, so the next one here is legitimate interest assessments. Um, following on my previous point about marketing, legitimate interest assessments um, need to be done and your DPA can help you with those. Um, I've recently done one on a university alumni. Um, as it became apparent as we were going through activities um, that the university carried out, that actually the alumni was quite a big business development um, department. So the same PECA and GDPR requirements apply to them. Um, so we went through and documented that, which is very important evidence if we were ever challenged on those marketing activities that we had been through and put the safeguards in place that required. Um, the next one, DPIAs. So a big part of our jobs and certainly do at least one on a daily basis is looking at impact assessments. Um, I've recently done one for a SaaS product for a hospital that they'd be using as a critical part of their systems. Um, and whilst looking into the suppliers and sub processes, it, it sort of unearthed the fact that the third party was using some free source software, which was 
actually unsupported and had been published by Google. Um, so obvious safeguards and risk management um, were put in place for that. Um, obviously, a hospital having a lot of patient data, this DPIA will you know, be closely monitored to make sure that that stays compliant. Another big, big DPIA one is, of course, CCTV requirements. If you're an organisation that records the public, you're probably processing on quite a large scale, so that's a DPIA that we would normally carry out. Um, an example of a DSAR um, I've done recently <laughs> was just a, a, it was um, a parent putting a DSAR request about some of their information in their child's to a school. Um, but actually it showed a really important point because the meeting that they'd attended that they were sort of uh, aggrieved by was actually voice recorded just for the purpose of making some minutes afterwards. Um, unfortunately, then that recording wasn't deleted as it should have been with their retention policy and the parents asked for the actual recording itself, itself which again could have been quite straightforward but the school had gone and asked for consent um, to disclose that from staff members that were recorded thinking they were doing the right thing there but actually the lawful basis for processing that data was not consent um, so once the staff members had said they did not want that disclosed, we couldn't go back on that consent requirement and disclose it, even though consent wasn't the local basis to start with. Um, so that could, you know, could lead to very disgruntled um, data subjects and parents and, and possibly some ICA complaints. Um, the next one, privacy by design and default. Now this is one that's often sort of sort of put in the background, but actually this has been around for some time, um, but this is now a legal requirement. Um, I've got customers who are software developers, and that's where it's really obvious that they need to put in steps and controls from their development point of view, um, and sort of have regular check-ins with their DPO, and make sure their privacy by design is documented and built into their processes. And this is a really big part of accountability. I think this was introduced to stop, you know, mainly large organisations um, such as Apple, putting out products like the iPhone that have, have good privacy functions available, but they're not turned on as a default. And really, if you're going to, to do privacy by design and default, that, it should be that you have to, as a consumer, turn that off and not spend three hours trying to, to sort out how to turn it on. Um, but it is very hard as a, as a data protection officer to get sort of data protection, um, privacy by design and default within their organisation and everything they do, um, especially companies where it might not be so obvious that they need to do so. Um, I've put here as well, assisting customer prospects, I've spoken about this already, having documentation available easily um, does give you that competitive edge. Um, and having a DPO in place, I think, really shows that you're, you're more likely to be compliant. And in fact, as a DPO, I do sit on, on client calls and help them with their prospects, um, making sure that you know, all parties understand the obligations and how we're going to proceed with, with either contracts and getting legal people involved or, or manage risks. Um, so best practice advice on policies and procedures. Um, we do see a variety of industries and talk to a lot of experts. Um, internally within GRCI law, we have regular team meetings, um, which we get to moot ideas around and really draw on the experiences of, of, of a wide variety of people that have different educational backgrounds or different experiences. So it's not just one person's opinion within an organisation. Um, and doing work such as DPIAs on a regular basis, you really do build your your knowledge bank and can reuse that data. So, so getting best practice is, um, is something we do on a, on a regular basis. We also work across multi-academy trusts um, and complex organisations, working with different types of governing boards, different structures, different trusts, companies that are very complex organisational structures. Um, so, so that's something we're all quite well versed in. Um, and often have to deal with internal issues such as redundancies, you know, company buyouts um, and things that are dictated from parent companies, not 
not always European or, or US and don't always have a good understanding of the regulatory requirements. And then, of course, Brexit. Um, DPAs are talking quite a lot about Brexit at the moment. Um, we don't give specific legal advice as DPAs. Um, we can refer you to, to, to legal teams where we think we need to. But just being able to see, for example, as I've said before, your data flow mapping and working out that you may need to go and look at um, what legal mechanisms you're putting in place to cover those items um, is a useful thing to do. So what are the options and best practice for filling the DPA role? Um, obviously, you've got in-house options and outsourcing options, and the working party guidance does allow for, and GDPR does allow for outsourcing. Um, I've put some, some things up here about so the, the good sides of outsourcing your business. But personally, I decided to become a DPA for GRCI law so that I got to work within several industries to learn far more um, and so that you know, best practice can be shared and not siloed in the organisation. I think that expertise would be hard to gain as an internal DPA. You wouldn't get exposed to as many issues and you wouldn't um, get to see you know, what industries are really doing, you'd be very much focused on your own internal problems and issues. Um, a very good plus as well of outsourcing a DPA requirement is that actually DPAs do have some sort of um, more protection as employees um, and you can't sort of penalise them if they're, if they're working within their roles of being a DPA but you can end the contract um, for outsourced DPA you know, much more easily. So that obviously is an advantage um, when we go. We also um, have legal teams available within the organization and experts that can deal with breaches, DSARs, cyber security incidents, all those kinds of things as well. Um, so it's not just one person that you're relying on for this expertise. And we, we the, well, we do go on leave. I've said we don't go on leave. We do go on leave, but we don't go on leave altogether. So there's always, we work as that you have a primary contact as a, as a data protection officer. You also have a second. So if, if you're on holiday, you've got someone that knows what's going on with the organisation. Um, and, and failing that, there's a team sat behind us of people that can pick up anything urgent. With in-house items, um, there are obviously some potential conflicts of interest. Um, we have um, a shortage of DPOs as well, so recruiting them isn't as easy. Um, I think pre-GDPR there was a study done where 75,000 DPOs were required. I'm not sure what the number looks at the, at the moment, but I know that we are quite hard to come by. Okay, so do we have any questions? Just give it a minute for people to put them on the board. So we do have a question about um, the importance of keeping up with different legislation. And specifically, I think businesses at the moment are looking at the California new law in, in California and how it will affect UK businesses. So as DPAs, um, obviously we're very much focused on the GDPR, but as I said, we need to be aware of other laws and what's going on. And if you are compliant with the GDPR, you're in a pretty good state um, already. You'll have lots of good documentation and lots of processes available and lots of evidence. However, there are some, some nuances for laws um, and you might not have, especially California in scope. So if you are, for example, marketing to people in California, you will need to take those laws into consideration or if you actively engage in any transactions um, or make any financial gain after data processing activities within California, we, we will need to uh, adhere to those laws as well. Okay. Are there any other questions? Just give you a moment. Super. It doesn't look like there are any more. 
So you can feel free to contact us for any, any DPO or any other services that we provide um, from GRCDI Law. You can contact us as, at DPO as a service at grcilaw.com. Um, the, the handouts are available in the GoToWebinar page. You can download them, but they will be emailed to you as well. Thank you very much, everyone, for attending and have a good rest of your day.